So Tamara Jenkins, uh, your new film, Private Life, uh, explores the private lives of some really interesting characters who are going through uh, a really, uh, you know, uh, psychologically and, and, and physically uh, straining experience. Can you talk a little bit about where the idea for this movie came from? Well, I had my own, my husband and I went through our own fertility um, story. And uh, I, I've been saying it's kind of funny, but when, when my husband and I were sort of in the thick of it, we, uh, you know, which, and when your days consist of like injections and going to doctor's appointments and um, like m measuring um, intramuscular needles. And we went to, a, we went to the movies to kind of uh, decompress and the movie that was playing was knocked up. <laughs> and we uh, went in and we watched, you know, those actors, Seth Rogen and uh, Hagel, uh, have sex and get pregnant by accident. And, you know, we had, we totally forgot that sex was even part of an equation of getting pregnant at that point because we were so involved in the medicalization of, you know, procreation. And so I made a joke when we, when we walked out of the theater, I said, oh my God, you know, these people, they get drunk and they fall into bed and they get pregnant and knocked up. What would ours be called? What would our story be called? And I stopped and I said, it would be called Knocked Out. <laughs> well, that was probably on some, you know, some subconscious level, like the beginning of some kind of inkling that there is a movie relationship in there. So then how did the, uh, it was about 10 or 11 years ago, uh, how did the story, Yeah. how did the story develop um, over, you know, oh. the last decade? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wasn't writing it that whole time and it right. wasn't, I was consciously thinking, I am going to do a response to Knocked Up. It was just a kind of, I realized that on some level that is like something. Um, I don't think I started writing it in earnest until maybe five years after that or something. Um, I, although I think I scrawled some notes down in 2008 and I, I, it, it, I think that one of the things that helped me come to the idea of writing about it had to do with the fact that um, a lot of people that I knew were also kind of going through fertility stuff. It was like a little epidemic among my friends and they were all people who had sort of delayed. Um, they had, you know, un, sort of unusual lives. They were unstable lives, small apartments, um, artists, journalists, writers, and, by the time they got to a place, you know, and they were getting their careers organized and then they were arriving at this idea of having a family. And by the time they got there, it, you know, their bodies were saying, you know, it's not gonna be so easy now. So I was interested in that. And then in the culture, it just started being everywhere. There's so much writing about, you know, the female, you know, about, you know, about IVF, about assisted reproductive technology. And I just became kind of, and I was interested in writing about a middle-aged marriage. And I was like, what could be more the perfect metaphor for a middle-aged marriage than like banging your head up against this thing that you thought that you should just be able to get and then you're not getting it. Mm -hmm. so, then, so then talk, talk about, about the, the uh, uh, development of the story a bit. I mean, when, once you had this kind of initial spark of writing about a middle-aged couple trying to get pregnant, you know, at what point did you, uh, did you come across this idea of adding in, you know, their their step niece and right. putting her into the equation? Right. I don't know when it exactly happened. I think I had this idea of kind of engage, you know, taking this extended family and like in, that it, you know, that it starts to affect this huge, this larger extended family. I can't say exactly when, but I was scared of it. I remember being worried that I wasn't going to be able to nail the character as a, you know, I was like, how does somebody that's like 50 something write a character that's 20 something and not make it sound like a 50 year old somebody's idea of a 25 year old. So I was very, I was very um, anxious about getting her, nailing the I, who she was. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know where she came, when she came in, but I was, you know, she, you know, 
I think that I realized that there was a triptych that was occurring, that there were women from all different biological stages of their lives. And it was wherever they were, it was informing their behavior in a very kind of intense way that, you know, Molly's character was in a menopausal state and an empty nest moment. And that was informing her behavior in the same way that Catherine's biological reproductive moment was informing her behavior. I just thought that kind of started appearing and I was interested in it, mm -hmm. these stages. And, you know, the film um, walks this kind of very delicate line um, between comedy and, uh, you know, really sad uh, material. I mean, you know, some of it is uproariously funny, but then you also deal with a lot of the um, physical and, and psychological strain that this causes on all of these women. So how do you find that balance? I mean, how do you find humor within something that, you know, is is kind of, you know, not very funny? Right. I think it's the thing that I love. I mean, I think it's what I look for in my own, in stories and movies. And I just love that in between spot. And I think that it's probably just my voice in a certain way. And it's, it's also something I aspire to. So it's, you know, but I, yeah, I, and I just think there's something very honest about the, the braiding of, oh my God. My phone's ringing, oh, but um, okay. something, can I turn it off or? Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, yeah, yeah, you're fine, don't worry, yeah. I think that there's something, sorry. I think that there's, all right, I'm starting over. <laughs> Happens. I think that there's something really exciting about, and honest about the braiding of those two things. I never feel like if I'm watching, you know, a straight tragedy that that's kind of capturing life. And a straight, I just feel like that it is that, and also these kind of intense experiences push people in a way that make them bumble and make them say things that they're not supposed to say and push their buttons in a way, in a kind of extreme way that it's bound to occur. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, I mean, your cast helps a lot in that. I wanted to talk a bit about uh, them. First off, um, Catherine Hahn and uh, Paul Giamatti as the couple at the center. Can you talk a bit about, um, you know, obviously they've got a great track record, the two of them, but yeah. you know, what made them specifically right for this couple in your film? Um, well, I think that they are actors that know how to straddle that. They can straddle the comedy and the pathos and not all actors can. And they are in the same way that I thought that in my last movie, that Laura Linney and Philip Seymour Hoffman had that kind of capacity. And I kind of look for that. I'm excited by that. And, um, you know, and I was also really thrilled about having them, like, I just felt like it was exciting for me to see Paul play something that was the whole spectrum of the human experience because he plays extreme characters and types. And I was just very into, this more nuanced kind of portrait that he got to mess around in. And and uh, I just was very excited about the two of them together. And I remember the first time we got together, uh, I took a picture of them and I was, I remember feeling like, oh my God, this is an actual couple. This is a real couple. It's not a movie couple. They feel like people. And I was really excited about it. Uh, you mentioned Molly Shannon uh, earlier as the um, uh, sister-in-law also of John Carroll Lynch as her husband. Can you talk a bit about uh, working with the two of them? And also, I mean, the contrast uh, between their couple and uh, Giamatti and, and Catherine Hahn. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, um, Molly was the only person that I approached for this part. I was, I thought she was amazing in that movie, I think it's not called Other People or Some People or- I think it's Other People, yeah. I think that's- okay. Other People, not Ordinary People. No, <laughs> not that one. <laughs> and I thought she was so fantastic in it. And I really, and I, and, I, and I had met her once in real life and thought I really liked her and I just pursued her for the part. Um, yeah, there, I mean, Molly's, I always thought that if I expanded on Molly's character, if I, if it was, a if it was a series and I kept kind of, I felt like she was somebody who 
put some of her aspirations aside and started a family and started, you know, had Sadie at a kind of a young age. And that there was a part of her that maybe always felt, I feel like there's a tiny part of her that's really jealous of Catherine's character, um, even though she would never admit it. And, uh, you know, they're different. They're leading a more traditional life. They have a house. Catherine and Paul live in a rent stabilized apartment off Avenue A. Um, they have the trappings of a kind of, you know, traditional family, even though there's a divorce and it's a second marriage. And um, yeah, there's a big difference. And they have, you know, more, you know, he has a normal job. He's a, he's a periodontist. Not artists living by hook or by crook, you know, in a rent stabilized apartment. Mm -hmm. um, we talked a little bit about writing the character of Sadie, and uh, as someone who's uh, close to her general age range, you did a good job of, of capturing <laughs> my generation. <so. laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I was like a total, you know, I was just every, any person that was in my frame of vision that was in their 20s was just a they were just a case study for Sadie. I, <laughs> I lifted things. I lifted things. I lifted a, a line that my husband's uh, niece, our niece, came over to our house and she bent over to pick something up from her bag and she said, oh my God, I'm totally whale tailing you because her underwear were climbing up yeah, yeah. on her thing and I just, her pant line and I just, I, I just said, I have to go write that down, I'll be right back. I was so excited to just the, I was so open to hearing um, people talk that were of that age. I think that's something that all writers do subconsciously or not. Um, <laughs> but um, talk a bit about uh, Kaylee Carter, the young woman who plays her. Um, she's been in a couple of things on screen before, uh, but this is a big role for her. Uh, what made her write for the part? She was, somebody fell out of the movie a couple of weeks before we um, shot and we were, it was a time crunch and my casting director, Jeannie McCarthy, auditioned like 90 people. I don't know if it's exactly like that, but it's pretty close, maybe a hundred. It was a lot. And it was every girl that was available at that moment, you know, to, uh, in that time frame that was the right age, you know, every, every 20, 20 to 30 year old. And, um, and there were wonderful actresses, but I was, and we were up against, the clock and I said to Jeannie you know isn't there just like a, a theater actors under a rock somewhere I mean this is New York and there's people doing theater in basements and 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 and, and there's just gotta be uh, and then um a couple of days later Jeannie emailed me and she said I found a girl under a rock and Kaylee was not under a rock because she was in London and she was in a Mark Rylance play but she uh she read for Jeannie and Jeannie sent me the tape and I thought she was really interesting. Then she came in a million times. I don't know how many times because I, I didn't, there wasn't a body of work to refer to. It's exciting and thrilling, but it's also a little scary. So, I mean, Kaylee said the other night that she, she said, I think I read every single, you know, scene in that movie multiple times to audition for it. So she said, which was great because we didn't have any time for rehearsal barely. And I had to memorize it. So, um, you know, I, she, she had to, she had to come back a lot, but I was really excited about her. And, and I'm so, I was so grateful that Netflix let us do it. Let us cast a person that wasn't, you know, a, a, a big name. And I think she's wonderful. And it's so exciting. It was so exciting in terms of the movie because the way that Kaylee was a young actress and the way she looked up to Paul and Catherine was a, kind of a metaphor for what was happening in the movie. It was a reflection because she looked up to her uncle and her aunt and they were, um, and she romanticized them. And there was just something interesting about that play of her being thrilled to be around them for other reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that, uh, you mentioned Netflix, and I actually wanted to ask you about the distribution of this film, uh, which will be released in theaters and on Netflix on October Fifth, um, I, you know, I remember growing up in North Carolina and, and having to wait uh, about a month and a half or so to see the Savages at a local art house theater. Oh my God. 
<laughs> so I wonder, um, as an independent filmmaker, as somebody who's uh, you know uh, made her, her fair share of films, I mean, is a place like Netflix good for independent cinema? Is that a place that um, really helps get the films out there? Why is it good to go there? Well, they saved my ass. So, I mean, yeah, it was good for me. They really came in and saved my ass. The movie was in a situation where it could have fallen apart and it didn't because of them. Um, and then on top of it, there was this creative freedom where they let me cast who I wanted to cast. There was no notes on the script when I moved it to them. They didn't say, okay, we'll make the movie, but you have to change the second act and do, you know, there were no development notes. It was straight ahead to production and that was pretty amazing. So, you know, from my point of view, uh, it's been like, you know, a gift, mm -hmm. you know, and then there's the whole, and then within the short amount of time that I've been making the movie with them, I went from having one cinema in New York and one cinema in LA to a whole, now there's gonna be one in uh, San Francisco, Seattle, Boston, a couple, like nine or something, cities. So yes, it's a short release, but it's gonna be out there. If you're a cinephile and you wanna see the movie projected in a proper theater and you're fast enough, you can do it. And then for the rest of humanity that doesn't wanna leave the house, um, they'll get to see it. So I don't know, it's been, it's been a fascinating thing to witness from even not as a filmmaker, like what is gonna happen? It's all changing before our eyes. Right. Uh, now you are an Oscar nominee uh, for writing The Savages. What did that recognition mean for you? It was, it, that was amazing and incredibly aff affirming, especially since writing is, um, is so hard and you can really feel isolated and alone and like you're delusional. You can really feel delusional sitting in your room, you know, writing. Um, it was, it was, it made me feel like maybe I am a writer. I mean, I don't know why I always feel like a fraud at the beginning of writing anything. I always feel like I never did it before and it's a totally new thing. And how did I ever do it before? It's like, you're starting over from zero and you know, having that in the back of my head reminds me like you did do it before and you did it and people in your profession thought it was good. So you probably can do this again, like have a little faith. I don't know. It's a nice thing to have there when, you know, your morale is low. Yeah, certainly. Um, one last thing I wanted to ask you, I don't want to spoil the ending of this movie, so I won't. But I will say that at the end of it, I was left thinking about where these two characters are gonna go from there. I wonder, as a writer, um, in, not just in this movie, but in any movie that you write, I mean, do you ever think about, you know, your characters beyond the end of the film? Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, this is very answers to that question because it's about, it lingers and without saying exactly what it is, it's more open so you, it leaves this where, you know, um, it's funny. I think there's a finiteness to the movie also when, which has to do with Paul going from one side of the booth to the other side of the booth. It almost feels like that's the, I don't know. I always say that's the happy ending he crosses and he sits next to her and they're on that side and he reorganizes all the play, the, the place settings. And he says, that's better. And I feel like, that's the happy ending. Not that everything has to have an happy ending, but then it, there's this kind of trail from that that is about kind of the moment to moment experience of you know being alive and not knowing what's gonna happen next. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, congratulations on the film. Uh, it was a real pleasure talking with you. Oh, thank you too. Thank you. Bye, this is so weird.